Ripley Sills, exactly a hundred years ago. This place has become so famous in those hundred years, you can write from anywhere in the world and just say Carnegie Hall or even Carnegie and people get it. Do you know, Peter, whenever I come to Carnegie Hall, they have a little fanfare like that. I've just never arrived without that. And the first time I came here was 52 years ago when Lily Pons was singing and I was 10 years old and they had a fanfare for me then too. Do you know, a hundred years ago when Andrew Carnegie built this place, he said he hoped the history of the hall would be intertwined with the history of America and the times. And for the next several hours, we're going to relive some of the history of the hall as well as the fabulous music. We certainly are. And the fabulous music you're going to hear is by Tchaikovsky and Brahms and Beethoven and Mahler and Mozart and Verdi and Wagner. We're going to run the whole gamut and you're going to see and hear some of the greatest superstars of our day. On this 100th anniversary, it's truly an international event. So we also welcome our viewers and our listeners in Japan and in Europe as well as in Central in South America. A great evening ahead of us. Won't you come on inside and join us? Carnegie Hall. Live at 100. The Gala Centennial Celebration. With guest artists, the New York Philharmonic, Zubin Mehta, music director. James Levine, conductor. Zubin Mehta, conductor. Alfred Brendel. Placido Domingo. Empire Brass. Marilyn Horn. Yo-Yo Ma. Me Dory, Jesse Norman, Leontine Price, Samuel Ramey, Mstislav Rostropovich, Isaac Stern, Pinchas Zuckerman, the New York choral artists, Joseph Flummerfeld, director. When we were standing outside on New York's 57th Street, we told you what a historic place this was. There are surely Americans and many people in other parts of the world who've never seen how beautiful Carnegie Hall is. So take a look at it. It seats 2,800 people. In his day, 100 years ago, Andrew Carnegie could have had any architect he wanted. All the famous ones of the day would have been interested. In fact, he chose a man named William Tuttle, who was a member of the New York Oratorio, for which, in part, the hall was built. And William Tuttle's grandchildren are here, and Andrew Carnegie's grandchildren are here today. There's so much history in all that. I go back to 1956 here. I, I was going to ask you when you first came. I wasn't going to let you even wait. <laughs> <laughs> I made my Carnegie Hall debut with Leonard Bernstein here. They reassembled Toscanini's band uh, for the first time after a long hiatus. It was one of the most special evenings of my life. You can imagine what it's like for a kid from Brooklyn to be making her debut in Carnegie Hall with, with Leonard Bernstein. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you again. You bring such a sense of excitement to A sense of history is what you really want. <laughs> no, I wasn't that very careful about that. That's what you meant, Peter. <laughs> well, down there on the stage is the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, and people may forget that in the late 1950s, this was the home of the New York Philharmonic, and it was when it moved up to Lincoln Center, which is not too far uptown on the west side of Manhattan, that this hall really began to get into trouble. That was before the great era in which it was saved, which we'll talk about this evening. But it's very suitable to have them here tonight, and their conductor and musical director, Zubin Mehta, is here. And they're going to begin tonight's program with the Star Spangled Banner.
And now, a few words from the chairman of Carnegie Hall, James Wolfenson. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jim Wolfenson from Carnegie Hall, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Board of Trustees to an absolutely memorable event. A hundred years ago, uh, Bishop Potter uh, gave what was reputed to be a lengthy dedication speech. And uh, we're trying very hard to follow in the traditions of the hall, but that's one that I think we can avoid. I had prepared a lot of uh, remarks that I thought were meaningful because I've had many years to get ready for tonight. But they all went out of my head this morning when a miracle occurred. Uh, we were here with 2,800 choristers singing some of the great choral works uh, of history. And we started with a rehearsal. And at 11 o'clock, 2,800 voices sang out in this great hall. And we all thought, this is a very special celebration. And it was really a touch of history. It was a touch of the presence of the beauty of this hall. And in a way, it was a symbol for the future because there were young children here. And it was a present occasion, not one celebrating the end of a life, but one in joyous and vigorous midlife. And as you look round this hall, this is not an old lady that we're celebrating tonight. This is a young, vigorous lady with a hundred years of experience full of love for us and full of love for the future. Have a great night. Jim Wolfenson, who is the uh, chairman of the Carnegie Hall Board of Trustees and the cellist in his own right, he mentioned the 2,800 choristers to which he uh, referred to as a miracle before the evening is over. We will hear a portion of that astonishing celebration this morning. This is not only the celebration of an American institution, but a celebration of American music and musicians and composers. Yes, and this hall is well known for the number of world premieres that have occurred in it. And so the fact that our next presentation is a world premiere is not so unusual in itself, except that it is by an American composer, and the composer happens to be a woman. So we have a, a few rarities in there, although she joins very distinguished company tonight uh, in the presence or absence of Erin Copeland. Uh, her name is Joan Tower. She is a composer in residence for, uh, for the St. Louis Symphony. Teaches at Bard College just north of New York City. That's a tiny yeah. little college. Yeah. You know, Ed, that's what America is all about, the land of, of opportunity for somebody that has to write. This is her third fanfare, I want you to know. I, but, but tell people why it's her third fanfare. It's a nice story. Go ahead, you tell it. I'm, I, I'm, <laughs> because she didn't quite get the first two to her satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the old story. Right. You keep doing it till you get it right. right, and I think she has finally gotten it right because um, it's getting its premiere at Carnegie Hall. And so tonight, we're going to hear Joan Tower's third fanfare for the Uncommon Woman who will make a conductor. You'll hear the Empire Brass and members of the Pokemon Brass Fest.
composer residence of the St. Louis Symphony teaches at Bard College. What an exciting event. It has happened so many times in Carnegie Hall, but for the individual involved, it must be stunning. And now we move on to Beethoven. I asked somebody when we were preparing for this program why Beethoven was on the program. Their answer was quite simple. Beethoven should be on every program. And in this particular instance, uh, the New York Philharmonic uh, Zubin Mehta conducting is going to play Beethoven's Egmont Overture, opus number 84. This is Zubin Mehta's last season with the New York Philharmonic. He is going to be replaced by Kurt Mazur, who came to New York City from the Gewanda House Orchestra in Leipzig.
Samuel Rainey. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce him. Um, I even sang with him at the New York City Opera. His voice has been described like a roaring lion. And let me tell you, when you stand next to him, <laughs> there's no question about that. He's from Kansas, and, he, and he's flown over from London, where he's rehearsing for an opera, and he's going to go right back tomorrow. Right, and he's doing Scarpia, which is unusual, because that's usually sung by a baritone. Mm. But it is a phenomenal voice. It, it, it's, it's so exciting. And uh, the fact that he's going to do Handel is also a specialty of his, so I, I think we're very privileged. He's going to be singing The Trumpet Shall Sound from Messiah, and of course the great Maestro James Levine will be conducting with him. Samuel Rainey, made in America, a bass.
George Frederick Handel, who was born in Germany, lived most of his life in Britain, to Aaron Copeland, who was born just across the East River in Brooklyn, and came to represent the vision of the great American heartland. You could not have a celebration of Carnegie Hall without Copeland on the program. He made his debut here as a pianist uh, and has been played here countless times. Tonight, uh, three songs, sung by the great mezzo-soprano Marilyn Horn, Simple Gifts, Long Time Ago, and At the River. Uh, in keeping with Copeland's attempt to draw on diversity of American life uh, for his music. One comes from a minstrel show, and two of them come from the music of the church.
Patrick Dane is probably the greatest Rossini singer of her time. And instead, she chose to come out on stage and sing three songs by an American composer and, and sing them gloriously. She's been a great promoter of, of American music. And I think it's just so special that given this, this showpiece moment, she chose three works by the great Aaron Copeland. I mean, Marilyn's really something special. She's got that wonderful fresh face. She sang tonight for the 46th time in Carnegie Hall since she made her debut in 1961. She's used to the place. <laughs> you know, most of us admire Placido Domingo for his extraordinarily beautiful voice. But there's the other thing we admire him for is that he's constantly exploring to enhance his repertoire. And just a few weeks ago, he sang at the Metropolitan Opera Parsifal for the first time. But tonight, we're very lucky, he's going back to one of his favorites in the Italian repertoire. And he's going to sing the beautiful aria from Verdi's Luisa Miller, Quando le sere al Pracido. And of course, he will be singing with Maestro James Levine, who is the artistic director of the Metropolitan Opera, and of course, with the great New York Philharmonic. Placido Domingo, born in Spain, raised in Mexico, made his Carnegie Hall debut in 1966. Has one of the largest repertoires, sings 80 roles in opera. Perfidia, un'alma si nera, si mendace, bella conobbe il padre. Ma dunque tu, le speranze, le gioie, le lacrime, la fanno, tutto è menzogna, tra
I'm recording here in New York, and immediately we have a very thrilling thing happening next week. Um, an opera house. It's an open. opera house opening in Sevilla. Because of you. Well, uh, I was very much pushing for it, and we put the first stone just over two years ago, and it's the theater of uh, La Maestranza in Sevilla, which it will be the house for the Expo in 92. Of which you are the general director? Well, the musical advisor, Mus let's well, put it that way. And you're running the and opera company in Los Angeles? A little, a little bit, yes. just as a musical advisor. And, you and you're conducting Tosca in the Metropolitan Opera? And you still play t soccer? That, that especially, you know, that, that's, that, I have to do that. You know, they used to say our careers were parallel. I won't conduct and I refuse to play soccer. Well, but we can play which other sport? We can play anything you like. Anything. <laughs> I'm really very thrilled after celebrating this 100th anniversary to go back next week in Spain and open a new theater. So that's thrilling. Safe okay. trip. Okay. Placido Domingo singing from Verdi. A hundred years ago tonight, Tchaikovsky came from Russia to conduct Tchaikovsky. 
Tonight, Rostropovich plays Tchaikovsky. A word of information for those of you who may be coming to Carnegie Hall in the not-too-distant future. There is now something new here, a wonderful new exhibition of some of the Tchaikovsky memorabilia from his great visit here, including some of his diaries. He was the drawing card a hundred years ago. He actually came here because he thought the money was pretty good, among other things. But tonight, Rostropovich plays Tchaikovsky variations on a Rococo theme, Opus 33. Mstislav Rostropovich, Dubin Mehta will conduct the New York Philharmonic.
Tchaikovsky comes from Russia to play and conduct Tchaikovsky, the other great Russian. Mstislav Rostropovich plays Tchaikovsky. He also has a good sense to be married to an opera star. <laughs> <laughs> Galina Vishnevskaya, his wife. We have on stage now two of the huggiest, kissiest men in the world. <laughs> They will have a chance to talk to him, I think, for just a moment. Maestro Rostropovich, can you hear us? Yes. Maestro, can you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Good evening. It's Peter Jennings at Beverly Sales. How nice to... Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> hello, Slava. Hello, hello, everybody. Hello, Doug. A question for you, Maestro. You, you were raised in Russia. When yes. did you first hear of Carnegie Hall? Uh, no, 1956. I play first performance here, first American performance, Symphony Concertante Prokofiev, with New York Philharmonic and Metropolis. Had you ever heard of, of Carnegie Hall when you were a child? Uh, I don't hear about Carnegie Hall. I was too far in Russia. You know, the Russia was too iron, iron curtain. Well, it was our game that they let you out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What yes. was it like when you went back? Oh, at Carnegie Hall, that's, you know, that's something very special place, and that I'm so proud that with Carnegie Hall have connection, also Russian people and great Russian like Tchaikovsky. I'm right. very proud. Maestro, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Fabulous uh, performance. You know, if they let us tell anecdotes about Carnegie Hall, we'd be here all night. Why don't we just start? I don't think they really want us to at the moment. Okay. But I will tell you this, that in 1938, when Betty Goodman had the great jazz concert here, which was a turning point for jazz in America on the concert stage, came time for intermission, and someone said, well, how long do you want the intermission to be, Mr. Goodman? And he said, well, how long does Toscanini take? We, on the other hand, will just be right back after this station break. Carnegie Hall, live at 100. The Gala Centennial Celebration will continue after this brief intermission. 
This program is made possible by the people of Northern Telecom, advancing the power of global voice and data communications into the next century. Northern Telecom, technology the world calls on. And by the National Endowment for the Arts. And by the support of viewers like you. This is PBS, the public broadcasting service. Throughout the universe, there are billions of stellar cycles of birth and death. Some stars die violently in explosions that hold the secret to our lives. Join me, Richard Chamberlain, next time on The Astronomers. Monday at 7 here on 6 for The Astronomers. In spite of development, crowding, and legendary traffic jams, Paris remains an inspirational city, fashioned, it would seem, exclusively for writers, poets, painters, lovers. Monday at 8 on 6 for Travels, barging through Paris. All the world is coming to Denver during International Week 91. Experience the foods, music, films, and culture of many countries during this week-long series of workshops and events throughout Metro Denver, May 11th to May 18th. Call 303-691-2044 for details. International Week 91. Our world, your neighborhood. This is Channel 6, KRMA-TV, Denver. Carnegie Hall was completed in 1891. In 1891, goats could still graze freely around 57th Street. This was out of town, practically the country. The streets were not paved. All in all, it was considered an odd place to build a music hall, and it was said no one will travel so far to hear music. But when Andrew Carnegie laid the cornerstone, he said, it is built to stand for ages, and during these ages, it is probable that this hall will intertwine itself with the history of our country. Like a true friend, what Carnegie Hall reflects is the noble image of ourselves. But all that you see tonight almost did not happen. In 1957, this noble house was slated to be torn down and replaced with this. Artists protested, supporters cried out, it seemed a hopeless battle against time and money. In 1960, Isaac Stern rallied everyone to convince the city to save the building by buying it. At the last moment, the city agreed and soon declared it a national landmark. The hero had saved the heroine. Saved from destruction, but not yet saved from simply growing old. It took 25 years to raise the funds to bring Carnegie Hall back to life. What began as merely a physical challenge, the difficult and delicate job of restoration became a labor of love. surprises, many, many, many surprises. When we opened up the floor, there was supposed to be bedrock here. There was a void of about 10 feet, and that's where we found the first underground stream here. We had to pump it dry, seal it, and then put our footings down, 10 foot down, to support the new box office office below this lobby. The major piece of work encompassed the lobby, the backstage, the shell, the stage, the main house. It was accomplished in a period of time that at the beginning we thought would not be possible. 28 weeks. You look up here and this, is, this was done by the old timers and we're enhancing what the old timers did. It's a tribute to American craftsmanship and the working man.
I've never seen people as tired and with such sparkle in their eyes as the people working on this project. Uh, actually, my wife has given me a lot of trouble, too, because she says, I never see you. You're working seven days a week, seven hours. By the time you get home and you eat supper, you take a shower, you're ready to go back to work. The hall in general is absolutely beautiful. Painters, the, the color, the decorators, everybody. They did a wonderful job out of this world. As well, I like the arts and everything, so that's, I'd like to be in there instead of out here. <laughs> December the 15th, 1986, seven months and $60 million later, Carnegie Hall was reopened. And now, her 100th anniversary. Carnegie Hall Live at 100 continues. Welcome back to our 100th anniversary concert at Carnegie Hall. When we left you, we were listening to a man who first was associated with music in his mother's house in Russia. And now we're going to hear from one of the great international stars who first heard music in her mother's house in Georgia. In Georgia. I first met up with Jesse Cincinnati when she was a protege of a great arts patron there. He was called the Ding Dong Daddy of Cincinnati. <laughs>
but of course the wonderful Jesse Norman singing with Troy Hala from Wagner's Tannhäuser, accompanied of course by Sir James Levine and the New York Philharmonic. Sinfonia Concertante in E flat major, and two of uh, the most popular musicians anywhere in the world today, Pinka Zuckerman and Midori. Uh, if Midori is a reminder of anything today, aside from her superb musicianship, it may be of the second hundred years of Carnegie Hall. She debuted here on her 18th birthday only a couple of years ago. Thank you. 
100th anniversary concert. The last time we met was at Lenny's 70th birthday party. That was a very special occasion, as is this one. And I just learned your mother made that beautiful dress. Yes, she did. Is she still teaching you? Um, she doesn't really want to teach me, but sometimes I do ask for um, some advice. I noticed that today when you were warming up, yes. your mom was sitting in the audience and giving you a few last-minute pointers. Does she criticize your performances? Oh, yes, I asked her to. I had a mother who was also with me and, and my one true friend and critic. I knew when I pleased her that it was, it was good going. Who is this man standing behind you making all this noise? I'm an old friend of hers. This must be Pinky <laughs> if that's Medora. Tell How are you? I'm fine, dear. Yeah. I was just asking Medora. She said that she studied with her mother. I understand that you studied with your father. Well, she's still studying with her mother, but I'm going to study with my father. <laughs> now you're teaching your father. I hear that you're teaching. I'm teaching. I always taught. I didn't know that. Kind of. Well, you have to have to ask her about that. I don't really teach. I just kind of listen. I listen a lot. Well, it was our pleasure to listen a lot today. That was absolutely beautiful. And I'm very pleased to see you again. Thank you. And I hope I see you Good soon see you. again. Bye. Bye. As we said, there's no one more eloquent than Pinka Sukerman on Midori. He says you look into her eyes when you see she's playing and you can hear her soul. Now, for those of you around the world, this concert here in New York to celebrate the 100th anniversary is divided in two. We now come to the last number of the afternoon performance. Apologies uh, for the German, to those of you who are particular. Uh, Til Eulenspiegel, Lustige Streiche, um, by Richard Strauss. Til Eulen, the Merry Pranks. It's a kind of musical romp with the New York uh, Philharmonic, conducted by James Levine, who's been the conductor of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra here in New York for almost 20 years. He's young, he's 47 years old, he comes from Cincinnati.
Thank you.
Bill Eulenspiegel by Strauss, one of my favorite composers, Peter. He was so good at delineating character for his music. And of course, Jimmy is so fabulous. Uh, that's, that's his operatic training, of course, you understand, at, at bringing out all the richness of the characters. Can you believe that this guy, Strauss, also wrote Electra and Salome, the horrors of those two operas? Although he did say that Salome paid for his country villa. James Levine, who at 47, his mother and father used to take him to the opera. He's uh, now, I gather, you know this so much better than I, one of the real notable American his conductors. Now, one of the greatest conductors on the podium today. His father is also a sweetheart of mine. Um, I don't normally say that on, on national television, but, you know, it does come out. And you mentioned... You mentioned television. A word, too, about a really tough job, Bill Cosell who directs the music for us, showing us just how much James Levine enjoyed that for viewers in America, Japan, Europe, Central and South America as well. Very exciting music and performance. Perfect for television. Yes, absolutely. Well, with the exception of Copeland, Aaron Copeland and Joan Tower, all of the music you could hear tonight, you could have heard around the time the Carnegie Hall opened a hundred years ago. And it's, earlier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> much earlier. The exception, of course, is the Mahler, Mahler's Third Symphony, which we're going to hear later on, which was composed about ten years after, I think, Carnegie Hall. Yes, but there's right. another connection for people at home on today and a hundred years ago. are going off to the Waldorf to have some dinner, and I wish we were. <laughs> and then uh, we'll come back for the second half of our Which program. Which will, will also be very exciting. Uh, Copeland again, Beethoven, Brahms, Strauss, and the Third Symphony of Gustav Mahler, who conducted here as well, like so many others. We'll be back. Carnegie Hall, live at 100. The Gala Centennial Celebration will continue after this brief intermission. This program is made possible by the people of Northern Telecom, advancing the power of global voice and data communications into the next century. Northern Telecom, technology the world calls on. And by the National Endowment for the Arts. And by the support of viewers like you. This is PBS, the public broadcasting service. Throughout the universe, there are billions of stellar cycles of birth and death. Some stars die violently in explosions that hold the secret to our lives. Join me, Richard Chamberlain, next time on The Astronomers. Monday at 7 here on 6 for The Astronomers. How do we see what we can't see? The mountains beneath the oceans, the land under miles thick ice, the gold in them our hills. Take a look at pictures of the invisible next time on The Shape of the World. Monday at 9 on 6 for The Shape of the World. Toscanini embraced her and said, a voice like yours is heard once in a hundred years. Celebrate the phenomenal life and brilliant musical legacy of the singer who broke down racial barriers in her rise to international stardom, Marian Anderson. See Marian Anderson Wednesday at 9 here on 6. This is Channel 6, KRMA-TV, Denver. Carnegie Hall, live at 100. The Gala Centennial Celebration continues. Some of the greatest conductors of the 20th century have conducted at Carnegie Hall and helped steer the course of symphonic music in America.
young man, the assistant conductor to Bruno Walter of the New York Philharmonic, was living upstairs in one of the Carnegie studios when he got the call. Conductor's ill. You must conduct tonight. He hurried down the back elevator, crossed through the wings, and walked onto the stage. Barely 25 years old, he whispered to himself a Hebrew prayer for courage and for luck. I was standing in the wings there of this very stage at one minute to three, listening to Bruno Zerato, who had come out on stage, address the audience and tell them the unhappy news that they would not be hearing Bruno Walter that day, many groans, but instead would be hearing a young a conductor called Leonard Bernstein, the assistant conductor of the Philharmonic. And that's the last thing I remember until the end of the concert when I saw the entire audience there standing and cheering and screaming. But between the time of my entrance and the time of my last exit, I remember nothing. You know, a concert in Carnegie Hall is, I'm sure, a dream of every violinist all over the world. <laughs> Here, the violinist could make his instruments soar. And every great virtuoso gave the very best part of himself in return. When you think about all the great masters that have performed there, and you happen to be playing there, you feel that their souls and their imagination are going to give you some spark of inspiration. Since 1891, when Paderewski was mobbed on stage by his Carnegie Hall audience, every great pianist has played on this stage. Sergei Rachmaninoff, Joseph Hoffman, Artur Schnabel, Wanda Landowska, Rudolf Serkin, Claudio Arau, Glenn Gould, Vladimir Horowitz. He made his debut in 1928 at the age of 23 and maintained a brilliant career that spanned 40 years. Carnegie Hall, live at 100. The Gala Centennial Celebration continues with performances by the New York Philharmonic Zubin Mehta Music Director, James Levine Conductor, Zubin Mehta Conductor, Alfred Brendel, Yo-Yo Ma, Leontine Price, Isaac Stern, and the New York choral artists, Joseph Flummerfeld, director. And now we are truly live at Carnegie Hall. I've always wanted to say that. What, <laughs> what, a, what a mystique it evokes. Oh, I tell you, welcome back to the second part of our concert. Our lucky patrons have gone to a very sumptuous dinner at the Waldorf. We, on the other hand, ate out of paper plates. Turkey for me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that word. And they have just returned in, in celebrity buses, and they're taking their seats. And we're about to hear, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? This is the dinner, and that's the string quartet. And that's, oh my goodness, that's Anthony Quinn, and I had to sit here. That's ridiculous. That does look lovely, doesn't it? You know, you made a very interesting remark to me the other day when we were discussing uh, what some of the patrons have had to pay 
for the privilege of going to that dinner and hearing the concert. I believe you said that for $2,500, this hall brought over Tchaikovsky? He did for 25 days in America, they paid him. $2,500 for everything he did, not only here, but at Niagara Falls and a variety of other places. $2,500 for a ticket tonight, top price. Isn't that something? How time changes. Uh, yes, I guess so. But you know, today, when you, when you commission a composer to do a work for you, uh, it can go anywhere from $10,000 to, for an opera, a quarter of a million dollars. So um, Mr. Tchaikovsky would have been much better off today, too. We'll have a chance, I think, a little later on to talk about what an exciting time it was that uh, Tchaikovsky was when he was here. It was such a different time in America then, a hundred years ago. It was a cold night, by the way, May the 5th, 1891. Uh, nothing like tonight, where it's absolutely gorgeous. But, for example, to give you some sense of perspective, only 11 months earlier, the last armed conflict with the Indians at Wounded Knee in South Dakota. There were only 44 states, as we said earlier. 52 million Americans lived in the country at the time. It was a time also of the great industrial revolution. Andrew Carnegie dominated it because he dominated steel. Walter Damrosch, the then head of the Muir Oratorio Society, had this dream, talked Carnegie into it. And we've come so far in, in, in that 100 years, it seems almost unthinkable. They built this place for a million dollars. And you know what the recent renovation cost? About 80, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, things are looking up all the time. Oh, time change. We are waiting, by the way, for people to come back uh, in the fullest sense from this uh, gala at the Waldorf Astoria. Not everybody's in the hall, so we're running just a little bit behind. It gives us a little bit of a chance to talk about the place. The, this country also, when you mentioned 44 states, was really a cultural desert. There was, you know, you know, today every little community has its own opera company, has a hall in which to play, even if it's a high school auditorium. Um, there's a little opera workshop. So we are so used to this, this the word culture throughout our country. But there was a time, you know, when there was the Metropolitan Opera on the East Coast, and <laughs> very little else was going on. Certainly, we didn't have a major op uh, concert hall in But a in lot New of people thought the Carnegie Hall was the first. Of course, it wasn't. No. They were, I believe, the, uh, as a matter of fact, the concert hall, there was a concert hall in Philadelphia. And in Boston as well. And in Boston, yes, yeah. which was also torn down for a parking lot. So uh, <laughs> the more things change, the more things stay the well, same. Well, I was going to say, the more things change, the more things stay the same. A hundred years ago, Benjamin Harrison was president. You made he, that up. No, it's true. He didn't particularly <laughs> love music. But a hundred years ago, the press was on Benjamin Harrison's back because he was out traveling in California and Oregon, and they were questioning whether or not senior White House officials should be traveling at government expense. <gasps> so as you say, some things don't change. How true. I want, to talk, I want to talk about a miracle, okay, for a second. A miracle. A miracle. What uh, Jim Wolfenson, the president of Carnegie Hall, referred to a miracle uh, here earlier today. You've seen the afternoon concert. What you haven't seen up until now is what went on here this morning. There are 2,800 seats in Carnegie Hall, and as Beverly told me a couple of times this week, there isn't a bad seat in the place. But this morning, every one of the 2,800 seats in the place was filled by people prepared to sing song has always been profoundly associated with this hall, and under the direction of Robert Shaw, these 2,800 voices sang the Alleluia Chorus from Handel's Messiah. Just listen.
Hallelujah yeah. Chorus from Handel's Messiah, written in 1741 in 23 days. He was prolific. And he did it for money. A lot of it he did for money, yeah, too. <laughs> a lot for money. But he was, he was a fabulous composer, and I owe my whole career to him, so you'll never get a bad word about Handel from me. I didn't intend to make one. <laughs> Talk about Aaron Copeland. Aaron Copeland from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and a lot of us people are very proud of that, us Brooklyn people. Um, I really feel that the prominence that he won was from sheer talent and guts. He was, uh, he was a fabulous, fabulous composer. And there we have Master James Levine, reading the concert master of the New York Philharmonic. And he is about to conduct Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man, James Levine.
Fanfare for the Common Man by Aaron Copeland, one of a series of fanfares uh, commissioned by the Cincinnati Symphony in 1943 uh, from a great many American composers. Aaron Copeland chose as his inspiration the young men who were fighting overseas during World War II. Didn't I tell you that every time I come to Carnegie Hall, there's a fanfare for me? We had one at the top of the show, and now there's another one. I told you that. Every time I come in here, same thing. When you thing. came to Carnegie Hall the first time, were you nervous? No, I never got nervous. I think, you know, it, with an artist, you get very excited. Nervousness implies you don't know the outcome. And if you don't know the outcome, you shouldn't be on the stage. <laughs> now, 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 you know I've done a fair amount of research this week. So how about that phrase by Eugene Ormandy? If you don't get nervous at Carnegie Hall, you should be selling shoes. It's a fine thing for Eugene to say because he was the coolest cucumber I ever sang with. I, really, I mean, I would get up on, uh, go out there on the stage to sing with him. And let's say we were doing a Strauss piece. And I told you before that Strauss was one of my favorites. He composes. And just as he would get on the podium, he'd look at me and he'd say, Strauss, you know, is dead. I said, yeah. He said, but somebody forgot to tell him we're still playing the music. And that was his idea of being funny <laughs> before I was about to do my, my, my Daphne mad scene or something. But um, I, I don't think that nervousness is, is the real word. I just think it's a kind of excitement and a kind of high. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, if, you know, if you know your craft and you don't get to Carnegie Hall unless you do, um, that you don't really get nervous. The well, outcome is, is pretty well established. Well, the first piece of music ever played in this hall in 1891 was by Beethoven, his Leonorva Overture, and when asked why Beethoven, you can't have a concert without him. Uh, tonight, in the second half of the Centennial Concert, Beethoven's Choral Fantasy. Once again, James Levine, who is the musical director and conductor of the Metropolitan Opera here in New York, and Alfred Denville, the Czech-born pianist who has come here every year since his debut in 1973, Beverly tells me two wonderful reviews to play Beethoven.
Alfred Brendel, born in Czechoslovakia, now lives in London, playing Beethoven's choral fantasy with the New York Philharmonic, James Levine, and the New York choral artists as well. Now that's what you call major piano playing. And Mr. Beethoven stole from himself, and you know, whole thing is the Ninth Symphony. It's incredible. You know, they say that Beethoven, oh, listen to that, and he deserves it. I tell you, Beverly, I saw him half an hour ago up in the recital hall. He was tired. He just flown in. He was complaining he hadn't had any time to rehearse. The New York Choral Artists. Listen, don't tell me an audience doesn't know when they've heard something spectacular. Listen to that. they'll have a chance to talk to Alfred Brendel. You know, they say that Beethoven didn't like singers much because all the pieces he wrote were such killers. You know, he wrote for De Leon and then... I, have you ever sung Beethoven tonight? There's Alfred Brendel waiting to talk to you. Hello, Mr. Brendel. Bravo. That's what we call major piano playing. I wonder what minor piano playing is. <laughs> <laughs> Something you'll never know about. I, from my own experience, I, I've attended many of your concerts, and a lot of my friends have always said that when you come to play, that the hall is filled with other pianists coming to learn something from you. They call you a pianist pianist. How do you like that one? Well, that's what they used to do. Meanwhile, I am filling the big halls with no trouble, and there couldn't be 4,000 pianists at once. <laughs> <laughs> no, but maybe 2,000. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to join us and for the, uh, and for the excitement this evening, Alfred Brendel, who's uh, now going to go back to London. Since Paderewski was here in that first season, the piano and Carnegie Hall, the mystique's always been mixed up together. Can I tell you, just, I have to tell Please. you a funny story. I have to. When Paderewski came here, he was invited to speak at a dinner that he thought was to honor some very famous Poles. And when he arrived at the dinner, he found it was to honor some very famous polo players. And he stayed on to make the speech, and he said, the reason I'm here is you're all good souls who play polo, and I'm a good polo who plays solo. <laughs> I had to tell you that, Peter. It was just too good to let it go by. Uh, <laughs> how, many, how, many, how many names... Why do pianists stand out for me at Carnegie Hall? Van Cliburn was here earlier this week. I came to hear him play. And though a lot of people thought he was nervous and had hit a few wrong keys at the beginning, at least that's what the experts said at the time anyway, this place just came alive, partly because of his return, I think. And he spoke about the 100th anniversary. He spoke about Carnegie Hall having to talk to him by his mother. Uh-huh. Well, you know, tonight, this part of the concert is much more typical Carnegie Hall concert because it has instrumentalists and orchestral pieces. I mean, opera singers have opera houses to sing in, so a, a kind of electricity comes into a concert hall when you, when, you, when you see great big forces like chorus and a great big orchestra, and then a man sits down with these incredible hands, and I wanted to ask him why he had band-aids band on some of yeah. fingers. But a man sits down and gets this enormous sound out of the piano. It, it, it is absolutely, uh, uh, it's so thrilling. We're going to hear Isaac Stern in just a minute, along with Hilyu Ma, and, and I'd like to take a minute just to tell people who don't know Carnegie Hall terribly well, um, that this is much more than a concert hall. We keep referring to it as a concert hall, but it's really a cultural center. It's a place where people teach, it's a place where people rehearse, it's a place where people learn, and there's something going on all the time uh, inside this extraordinary establishment. The other night when Van Cliburn was here, I went wandering up the back stairs, and there's a small ballet company, the Newbert Ballet Company, giving a performance of a children's ballet. There is a richness here, and Carnegie Hall, of course, has extended that out uh, into the community through young people's concerts, and what a change in 100 years. 100 years ago, of course, the people who could afford to come to this hall were the rich. Almost 1,200 millionaires, somebody told me, in 1891. Now it's so much more democratic. When the Beatles came, the Beatles' audience came. When Frank Sinatra comes, his audience comes. And, oh, it's exciting. But isn't it interesting that they wanted to come here? I mean, after all, Sinatra and the Beatles could have gone to Madison Square Garden, charged a fortune for a ticket, and made zillions of bucks. 
but they preferred to come here where you know they couldn't possibly make that much money. Um, but they walked away with being able to say Sinatra at Carnegie Hall, yes. Liza Minnelli at Carnegie mm -hmm. Hall, Benny Goodman. I mean, I was here the night Benny played, and they were dancing the aisles. I mean, talk about having your own dance company. And the audience was the dance company. They could not sit in their seats. They were dancing in the aisles. It was and Isaac Stern, of course, at Carnegie Hall. And Isaac Stern. Without Isaac, they sometimes call this the house that Isaac built. Isaac Stern in 1960 was the man who led the drive to save Carnegie. It now seems appalling to people that anybody in this city, this state, this country would have considered tearing down Carnegie Hall. But in 1960, when they planned to do it, when the Wreckers Bowl was imminent, it was Isaac Stern, wasn't it, Beverly? You were part of all that, who really was the driving force behind saving it. Yes, and he did some other wonderful things, too. He has turned this hall into a self-producer. In other words, there was a time you could rent the hall and just stand up there and, and do something. You can still do that. You can still do that. But what this hall has really accomplished is that it produces things of its own. Uh, there was a, a concert opera the other night of Electra with Ava Martin and, 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 and Lauren Mazel conducting. That was produced by Carnegie Hall. So they've, they've become not just a booking house, because, you know, any, any house, you can rent a movie. Well, yeah. you know what I like about the fact that you can rent this house, aside from the temptation must be there for everybody, but there is an Argentinian businessman named Pedro Firpe who rents it occasionally, comes up here, likes it all to himself, just sits on the stage and rehearses. So what? Everybody does that. Of course. We're going to go over to Brahms now. The first movement from the Concerto for Violin and Cello in A minor, Opus 102, Double. Subin Mehta conducting, Isaac Stern on the violin, and Yo-Yo Ma on the cello. Well, this house is on its feet for one reason only. And that is for Isaac Stern. It is sometimes called the house that Stern built, but it isn't true. It's certainly the house that Stern saved. First, in 1960, he went after concerned and wealthy citizens. They were facing a real deadline. Then he went to the government. The federal government wasn't interested. Went to the state. There was no national endowment for the arts then. And he just got people so fired up they couldn't resist. And now he plays with Yo-Yo Ma. They're great friends. Ma has been encouraged by Stern, and they play a lot together.
had some day, Isaac Stern. He's had some week. They've been celebrating the 100th anniversary all year, and he's been here right behind it all the time. Just not in the same orbit. Just not in the same. Oh, come on. Isaac lives a floor 
we're separated by a floor. He's fond of going around New York saying that he lives under Beverly Hills, so therefore I have to retaliate and say I live over Isaac Stern. When I moved in, I was so afraid that my singing would disturb him that I triple carpeted the floor. And we met at a dinner party up at his house, and he said to me, what's the matter, you're so good, you don't even practice? I said, I practice morning, noon, and night. He said, I never hear you. And I said, well, I carpeted the floor so he wouldn't be disturbed. I said, Isaac, I never hear you either. He said, I did the same thing. I didn't want to bother you. <laughs> so then, two of us listening by the fireplace in hopes that we'd be hearing one another. It never happened. Uh, he, it's, just, it's almost hard to put a phrase on the kind of force he's had in this hall. But he and all the people have worked for the Centennial, which, as I said, has been going on all year. Judith Aaron, who's the president of Carnegie Hall. We only get to see them on the concert stage, which, quite frankly, is enough in some respects. But to, uh, to, to be fully aware of what they put into keeping this hall going um, now and, and how invigorated they are uh, during this week is quite extraordinary. There's more to come, and we'll be right back. Carnegie Hall, live at 100. The Gala Centennial Celebration will continue after this brief intermission. This program is made possible by the people of Northern Telecom, advancing the power of global voice and data communications into the next century. Northern Telecom, technology the world calls on. And by the National Endowment for the Arts. And by the support of viewers like you. This is PBS, the public broadcasting service. Meet some people who may change the way you feel about growing old. A certain age, a celebration of experience on the next Smithsonian World special. Wednesday at 8 for Smithsonian World, here on 6. Toscanini embraced her and said, a voice like yours is heard once in a hundred years. Celebrate the phenomenal life and brilliant musical legacy of the singer who broke down racial barriers in her rise to international stardom, Marian Anderson. See Marian Anderson Wednesday at 9 here on 6. Next on Mystery, a true story of intrigue and murder. Do you think your wife knew the person who murdered her? Julia had no enemies. People are not always killed by their enemies. Why can't you tell me what's happening? The Man from the Prue on Mystery. Thursday at 8 here on Channel 6 for Mystery. This is Channel 6, KRMA-TV, Denver. Artist studios came to Carnegie Hall in an unusual way. In the 1890s, money was tight, so the hall literally raised its roof and built the studios for the rents they would generate. By doing this, they created the first and longest running cultural arts center under one roof in America. There are now 140 studios at Carnegie Hall where artists live and work and a variety of schools flourish. The studios continue to be a place where the arts intertwine and the young may steal glimpses of their idols at work. When I decided to be an actor, my father, who had been to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, said, you, you should go to school there at Carnegie Hall. Well, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts had its home at Carnegie Hall for 60 years, practically from the day Carnegie opened its doors in 1891. Some of the students included Edward G. Robinson, Agnes Moorhead, Spencer Tracy, Rosalind Russell, Grace Kelly, Kirk Douglas, and Bancroft. We studied the arts of makeup, the art of dance, uh, of sword play, and of voice and projection. We'd yell out onto 57th Street from the 13th floor and all that in our uh, projecting for this theater. You had a real sense of history here and a sense of art. Uh, my own association goes back to oh, over 50 years ago when I was a music student and I used to haunt this hall, uh, all the various parts of it, and uh, I think it's alright to tell it now after 50 years. There was a little door up, up there where the second balcony is, and there was a little door which for some reason, it may have been a fire regulation, but 
that door was always open. It was never locked. So those of us who became au courant with the operation of this uh, building used to use that to sneak in. And we would sneak in sometimes when Arturo Toscanini would be rehearsing, not playing, but rehearsing, and several of us would sneak in and we would watch the maestro rehearse. I worked in Carnegie Hall in Studio 61, which is the big studio on the sixth floor. Now, the sixth floor is separated from the eighth floor, not by two stories, as you would think, but by five steps. And I cannot explain this, except that that is quite characteristic of Carnegie Hall, and nothing is really logical there. But this was the largest studio on those several floors. The first inhabitants were the Duncan dancers, and they were followed by Dennis Shaw in school, Ted Shaw and Ruth St. Dennis. But in my time, I came there just before the war. I studied and took classes there and rehearsed for the next 20 years. The thing about the, that whole floor, the two floors, was that there was the sense of growing life, the in intent the great intent of the student worker. It was overpowering. It came through the walls, you'd hear the pianos. Sometimes it was real music, sometimes it was banging, but you'd hear it. And you met them in the halls, and you met them in the laboratories, in the washrooms, and you met them carrying their little suitcases and bundles, or their satchels of music. They were working. Coming to the Carnegie Studios were dancers and choreographers, iconoclasts and classicists, who would shape and influence nearly every facet of the dance world. Martha Graham, Jerome Robbins, Bob Fosse, Michael Kidd, Alicia Alonzo, Alexandra Danilova, she was, of course, a teacher. The fruits of all this kind of endeavor, sometimes it was dancing and sometimes it was music, was downstairs in the big hall being proven and being acclaimed and being immortalized. To know that there was a standard, to know that there was a recognition, to know that there was a preservation of what was beautiful, that helped. It was like a steady hand at the back. Carnegie Hall, live at 100. The Gala Centennial Celebration continues. We're back, and we've got Isaac Stern. Hi, Isaac. Hi, Beverly. How are you, love? How are you enjoying your perch in the clouds? We're, we're just doing fine. How do you feel after that ovation? And you didn't even have to play. I don't think you ought to get a standing ovation before you play. They could have waited. You know, with that kind of an ovation, one maybe should leave when one is ahead. But... I tell you, it's, this whole this whole week is, I know I'm numb. It's just one excitement after another. And I'm glad that you had a chance to show, I understand you showed a clip of the singing in the house <laughs> this morning yes. when everybody was here. I came this morning. I just have to say that in all the 30 years that I've known Carnegie, and I don't think there's ever been a moment like that, to walk into this house and to climb up as I did and look down and see a raft of scores and people singing their hearts out with affection in all colors and all shapes and all sizes, some in sweaters, some in shorts, some in dressed up, old ones, young ones, and all of them singing with such love for music and for the faith that's in the words that they were singing. I have never heard this house sound so blessed by people it's a people's place as it has never before been. Maestro, yes. I'd like you to look up at the camera if you wouldn't mind, because I think people want to see your eyes. Because uh, I'm looking I'm at the monitor. There, yes, I'm told I told there's been a tear in your eye more, more than one occasion. There has what, been. What's next now for Carnegie Hall? What does the second hundred years look like to you in terms of shape, anyway? To be in the middle of all that is worthwhile, to be a part of it, not not to follow, but to lead to be aware of what music can be, of what young minds can do, and what new talent comes along. To be able to enhance the traditional greatness of music over the centuries, but to be aware of what is coming that is new, and to be worthy of picking the best that is possible. And something else you should be proud of, Isaac, because you've turned this house, really, from a, a rented hall 
into a hall that's full of new life, presenting new young artists ready for the next generation. And we have you to thank for that. It's not just a question of, of, of rebuilding the hall. It's a question of rebuilding the image of, of young, vital, uh, a home for young, vital talent. Beverly, if anybody, anybody in the United States who's aware of those, those forces, it's you, because you have done that in the world of opera, in the encouragement of young singers, in the building of, of, of repertoire for people to enjoy. Actually, you know very well as well that we can have the ideas, but if we don't have people of quality in the house who do the work, who do the planning, who have the imagination, who have the love to work 19 hours a day and not watch the clock, who care, who live here, who care about everything, if not for them, none of this could have been. If not for the Catherine Gavers and the Judy Aarons and the Christian Coors, these are people who give their lives to what they believe in. And it's this kind of of atmosphere I think that Carnegie engenders and which we want to have continue as part of the tradition that we will pass on to the next generations. You know, Isaac, as soon as you learn how to express yourself, you're really going to be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac Stern, thank you very much. Thank you both. I want to talk politics a little bit because in 1891, the basketball game, the Zipper and Carnegie Hall all made their debut and somebody in a Smithsonian magazine wrote the other day they could certainly have done without the Zipper. They weren't so sure about basketball, but they could never have done without Carnegie Hall. And one of the things that people have alluded on to tonight, and we talked a little bit about it earlier, is the democratization process. Because Carnegie Hall started off as a concert hall for the elite, it started off as a place for classical music, and then of course it became much, much more. We talked a little bit about it. Here's some more of what Carnegie Hall has been outside the world of classical music over the last hundred years. It was routine for presidential candidates to announce the start of their campaigns from the stage of Carnegie Hall. I firmly believe that the remedy for all the ills that we are suffering from today is the election of Alfred M. Landon. At Carnegie Hall, you could hear the most preeminent speakers of the day. Winston Churchill spoke here, Teddy Roosevelt, Mark Twain, Amelia Earhart, Albert Einstein. The very best of show business performed here. It was the sign of having arrived. You're gonna love me like nobody's loved me. Come rain or come shine. Very often, folk musicians fill Carnegie Hall with their music and their message. In 1964, when the Beatles came to Carnegie Hall, their fans took over 57th Street. I've got you under my skin I've got you deep in the heart of me When I walked onto this stage for the first time, I could feel something, really feel something like, a, like an electric shock go through me. And maybe it was the same kind of shock that George Gershwin felt when he walked out here nearly 60 years ago, that this was the place for the best to be the best. When George Gershwin debuted his work here in 1928, new American music was at Carnegie Hall to stay. There'll be no Mozart tonight at Carnegie Hall. Music was never the only sound here. There was comedy. My name is George Carlin, and I am a professional comedian, as opposed to the kind you run into at work all day long. Can you imagine the memories, the ghosts, Tchaikovsky and Mazursky, Pedagovsky, Paderewski, Stravinsky, Stokowski, Toscanini, Kusevitsky. 
If these walls could talk, they would have a very heavy accent. <laughs> All the very best comedians kept coming. There's Malachevsky, Rubenstein, Arensky, and Tchaikovsky. Sapelnikov, Dmitriev, Cherep, and Krizhinovsky. Kodovsky, Atobuchev, Moni, Yusko, Wakimenko. Solove, Yev, Prokofiev, Tiyamkin, Goreschenko. There's Winkler, Winkler, Bortnianski, Repikov, Felinski. There's Metler, Balakirov, Zolotorov, and Kvostinsky. And Sokolov, and Kopolov, Dukelsky, and Konovsky. And Shostakovich, Bora, Dinglier, and Novakovsky. There's Lyudov, and Karganov, Markeyevich, Panchenko. And Dargo, Miski, Chervachev, Skrab, and Vasilenko. Stravinsky, Rimsky, Korsakov, Mussorsky, and Grachani, Nuff, and Glazu, Nuff, and Sezak, Wikalini, Kachlachmanov. And whoever said violinists always had to be serious. <laughs> Before comedy, there was jazz. I wrote this, ladies and gentlemen, in 1899. As the appeal of jazz spread to mainstream America, these Carnegie Hall concerts were making jazz history. Treat me right, baby, and I'll stay home every day. Carnegie Hall would become a second home for the real giants of jazz. When I was growing up, one of my favorite albums was Duke Ellington, a uh, concert in 1942 in Carnegie Hall. And uh, Ellington subsequently did concerts every year in Carnegie Hall. So I just remember always hearing that concert. So whenever I'm in Carnegie Hall, I think about what Duke Ellington was in 1942, playing what I always grew up hearing on this record. Carnegie Hall welcomed jazz as far back as 1912 with the Clef Club, James Europe, and 125 Negro musicians. It was followed by such concerts as George Gershwin, W.C. Handy, and Fats Waller, and the landmark Benny Goodman concert in 1938 with Teddy Wilson, Gene Krupa, and Lionel Hampton. Well, in 1938, Benny Goodman asked me to play in Carnegie Hall with him. And I know that this was going to be an occasion because uh, black and white never played together before. Now, especially going into Carnegie Hall, this had to be a real occasion, and it was. Because that night we went to the Carnegie Hall, uh, all of us, black and white musicians together, we were all kind of scared. And then all at once, uh, the spirit hit us, and man, we broke loose and we started playing like mad. It was really come home. I said, well, we got me now. Carnegie Hall, bless you. From then on, the entire range of American music, blues, New Orleans jazz, big band, bebop, and other types of music would all be heard from the Carnegie Hall stage. America's preeminent composer, Duke Ellington, the world's greatest trumpeter and singer, Louis Armstrong, the most soulful, Billie Holiday, the mercurial, Dizzy Gillespie, genius of the 1940s and 50s, Charlie Parker, the timeless Ella Fitzgerald, Miles Davis, Sarah Vaughan, the one and only deeply swinging Count Basie. Each generation tries to make the generation before them proud. So in that respect, you're always aware of who you're representing, who your elders are and uh, how you can best represent them. So when you play in a hall like Carnegie Hall, you have a, a long tradition of music. And, and when I think of the, of the musicians who've been there, like Maurice Andre, like Duke Ellington, like Louis Armstrong, it makes me feel that I too am part of that legacy. And then I try to live up to it as best I can. Whether it was Irving Berlin singing, Oh How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning, or Martha Graham dancing celebration, or Will Rogers making us laugh, when you perform at Carnegie Hall, you become part of her tradition. Carnegie is where you come to, to 
either make it or not. Once you can play Carnegie Hall, in my opinion, you had made it. Because you don't get into Carnegie Hall unless you are something or somebody. There's something else I can tell you. When Carnegie Hall loves you, you are truly loved. Well, it may be true as a performer, you can't get into Carnegie Hall unless you're a somebody, but if you're a member of the audience these days, you don't have to be a somebody, but we certainly have some here. Andrew Carnegie's grandchildren are here today, 100 years after he paid a little more than a million dollars to build this, and William Tuttle's grandchildren are here. He was the architect who built this great hall, and Anthony Quinn, as you can see, is here as well. And the grandchildren of William Steinway, the great piano maker, are here as well. You want to talk acoustics for just a minute with all that noise? <laughs> acoustics. I wandered all over this hall last week, and you've sat everywhere. When you, for example, bring your mother here, I know you're very close to your mother, where do you want her to sit? Right next to me up on the stage. Really? You can't imagine the thrill of looking out at that audience. It, it, it is, it, it's breathtaking. The hall is one of the most beautiful in the world. Just knocks your socks off. Well, that's Judy Aaron, by the way, who is the president of Carnegie, or the general manager of Carnegie Hall uh, at the moment. She has done a terrific amount of work. And there is no real change inside this hall. Henry yes, Kissinger is here as well. He was here on the Make Good Orchestra. But there is, am I right, David? There's no bad seats, whether you're 65 feet up there and truly you're like the gods or whether you're down in the no, orchestra. But you know, Peter, they said that there was one place on the stage that was about four inches lower than the rest of the stage, and it was the favorite spot of all the singers, and they wore it down. Now that the place is renovated, I'm afraid they're going to have to find a new spot and start all over again. But it, Horowitz had a special place on the stage he wanted his piano to be? Oh, yes, and I'm sure an awful lot of other pianists tried the same <laughs> <laughs> to see if the results would be the same. You know, I saw Horowitz's farewell concert here. We were talking about audiences, and they just wouldn't let him go home. And he played his his encores, and he came out again, and he came out again. The audience kept demanding that he come back in. Finally, he came out, and he slammed the piano down, told everybody, go home. He said, I'm tired. <laughs> you know, there's Kathleen Battle, the lady with the white shawl. And Olivia Hogue, that very attractive woman, the wife of Warren Hogue, Warren right Hogue. behind her, you who is Warren, the it, it, editor of the New York Times magazine. He's an amateur cabaret singer. I was he's at a, a party singer. the other night, and he entertained us. Maybe we should get him up there on the stage. Maybe we should have amateur cabaret night here. I think that's a bad idea if he just that. I There's was reading in our research, Marilyn, Marilyn Moore. Reading in the research that William Tuttle, there was no science of acoustics then. There may not even be a science of acoustics today. But the, one of the things in terms of testing how sound would resonate in this hall was he went to a billiard table and he hit billiard balls on the table to see how the sound would travel and resonate. I heard a story that when they made the movie called Carnegie Hall here, that a big hole was made in the ceiling because of some movie equipment. And they found that it was such a fabulous uh, help for the acoustics that, with, that when they did the hall, I think they, they left the hole. I think somebody was putting me on. What do you think? Oh, I think probably. I think you probably We're right. now going to hear Leontine <laughs> Price sing Strauss, and I know you've got a story about it. You worked together, the two of you, on the Muppets program? We were doing a Muppet show together, and I had just retired from singing, and I said to Lee, since, can you imagine how quickly they, they forget a woman came over to me today and said, hey, didn't you used to be Beverly Sills? She said, that's nothing. A woman came over to me and she said, I know you, you're Joan Sutherland. And Leontine said, no, I'm not. I'm Beverly Sills. <laughs> Once again, this audience and the country and the world, because this broadcast is going to Japan and to Europe and Central and South America. Now, here comes right Isaac, here come Isaac Stern. He's going to say a few more words. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to say a few words. It's not the first time, nor the last. I've been asked this evening many times what this hall means to me, what this evening means to me. It's hard to tell you. It's hard to speak of a full heart, of a realization a true realization that what has been dreamed of 
by so many of us here at Carnegie, all the people and the staff who've worked on this for more than two years, that it's all come together and we are in truth here. More than anything else I think that struck me today was, was this morning, as Jim Wilkinson mentioned earlier on, to be in this house and to hear in every seat in the house a singing voice with scores, with affection, with the need to make music, to be a musician together for a moment. I don't think that in the hundred years that this house has existed, that these walls have resonated with the sound of the people of the city to the extent that they did today, where truly this became the people's house of music and which brought to a realization for all of us who work here, why? Why Carnegie? What is its importance? It belongs to the people. It is of the people, for the people, and most certainly by the people. You know, tonight's accolades have been most lovingly <coughs> and beautifully already said by the artists who've come to play and the others who've come to listen. I have to give special recognition tonight to two good friends, wonderful professionals in their own right, a great artist, Beverly Sills, a great news correspondent, Peter Jennings, who've been our host. For the audience that will be seeing this concert live around, live and on tape throughout the world, in Europe, Japan, and through PBS in the United States, they have been the voice of the evening, knowledgeably, warmly, speaking of the music and of the people involved. What we exemplify, I think, more than anything else, Carnegie, is a striving for beauty and toward the great power of music to touch the soul is what lends us grace to our lives and it makes, in truth, the ephemeral immortal. Fancy words. But it was said a long time ago by an Englishman, the famous author, anonymous, <laughs> that music, music can be described, but never explained. And there's that magic that makes music, creates itself here on the stage, live, live music made by live people to create in what is the very best sense a happening that will never again exist except at the moment when you are there and we are here. And the kind of happening which can only come from the greatest kind of discipline. Because only discipline frees the artist to let the imagination and the talent take wing. And this is indeed is what we are about. To give wings to new artists, new youngsters, to support the great artists who've created the traditions that have nourished all of us, to be aware of what is new in music and to try and pick what might be good in music, but never to forget where music came from and how the history of man, in the best sense of what he can find, can be found more in music than in any of the other arts. 
It is not limited by the word, which is subject to so many interpretations. It is not limited to birth, position, economic placement. It touches directly from the soul of the creative spirit through the artist to the listener. To that, for the next 100 years, we dedicate Carnegie. For that, we wish to pass on to the other generations who will be responsible for this, to help those to dare to try, sometimes to fail, but always to reach out, to try, try. Always to know that the glories of the past and the glories of today are beckoning to the future to do its best. We're lucky to be here at this milestone. This is just another link in Carnegie's long life. Carnegie Hall is a gift we inherited from our past. It's also our promissory note to the future, a declaration of faith. Be a part of it, and as you leave tonight, just remember those who have walked in this building and touched the walls here with magic for the last hundred years. Put your hand on it and touch history for the hall as you leave. Thank you. does have a way with words, and now a very great lady who has a way with a voice, and what a voice. The very great, great, and that's, I'm not using it loosely, dramatic soprano Leontine Price will sing Zweite Brautnacht from Strauss's Die Egyptische Helena. James Levine will conduct the New York Philharmonic.
Beverly of all the amazing facts I learned this week was the one I just learned from you. Leontine Place is 64 years old. You were not supposed to say that. Hmm. Now we come to a part of the program which I think perhaps some people even came this evening exclusively for, which is the Mahler. He was the conductor of the New York Philharmonic, not a very popular one, from <laughs> 1909, I think, to 1911. Very but mean Ma and pleasant little fellow. Yeah. Put spies in the fiddle section, someone told me once, to report on the gossip. But Mahler means Leonard Bernstein. Yes. Yes. You know, I, Lenny had a 70th birthday a couple of years ago, and it was a great big bash up at Tanglewood which lasted into the wee hours. It was some of it, a lot of it was televised. And after it was all over, Lenny and I had a nice, quiet moment together because, as I think I mentioned before, in, in 1956, I made my Carnegie Hall debut with him. And we, we stayed intimate friends for so many years. But I think it's impossible, by the way, that people don't know, but just in case, Leonard Bernstein died in October of last year. Yeah, I think yeah. it's, yes. Both our mothers were there that night, and they were having kind of a wonderful time <laughs> telling each other how wonderful their children were. And I said to him, Lenny, what's, what's the best part of tonight? He said, your mother and my mother. <laughs> he was well, extraordinary. <laughs> Zubin Mead is going to talk about Leonard Bernstein because this hall is so associated with Bernstein as well. He studied here, it was here. He stepped onto the concert stage as a substitute conductor for the first time. Zubin Mehta, the current conductor of the New York Philharmonic, about to leave. Now comes to talk about the man who is so identified with that orchestra, Leonard Bernstein. Ladies and gentlemen, you have probably noticed in your program that we would like to dedicate this movement from Mahler's Third Symphony to the memory of Leonard Bernstein. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you there is not one colleague on the stage here who does not and has not loved Lenny throughout the ages, does not remember his debut, and it was in this hall where, above all, he started those legendary children's concerts. It was from this stage where he made his debut with the New York Philharmonic that he tried to explain what music was all about to young children and therefore to the whole of the United States by television. Mahler was a composer that was so close to Lenny's heart. And it was his idea when he was supposed to be right here just now to end this program, it was his choice to have finished this incredible day celebration with the finale of Mahler's Third Symphony, aptly dedicated by Mahler to the concept of love. And so with your permission, we would like to dedicate it to him I cannot tell you how much we all miss him. So here's to you, Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> 